Okay, well, uh, thank you, Gerald, and thank you for our listening audience. Uh, glad to be back uh, and give you this webinar. We're talking, going to talk today about electro nanopatterning of ultra thin films, and as you'll see, uh, SPM AFM methods is are very good for accessing uh, nano lithography features. So to start with, I'm with Case Western Research University, where we are located in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we have a number of distinguished alumni, including uh, 15 Nobel laureates and the founder of Dow Chemical Company. Uh, we have a facility that uh, we have access from both uh, outside and students called the Think Box, which is uh, related to additive manufacturing. And uh, when you're around, I'll be happy to tour you with this facility. Uh, in addition, uh, we have a center called CLIPS that's involved with patterning, lithography uh, uh, of layer-by-layer -layer films produced by milk processing methods, uh, such as shown schematically here. Uh, so in our lab, uh, <clears throat> I'm part of the Macromolecular Science Engineering uh, department and uh, we have projects and funding related to uh, both basic science and uh, industry related work. Uh, just to give you a scope of the uh, other type of work we do on surfaces, we are involved with uh, not only with patterning but synthesis of new materials, nanomaterials, colloidal templating and uh, production of uh, nanomaterials such as quantum dots. Uh, just to show you how interesting the world of nanomaterials is, you can go from uh, features uh, that are produced from what we call top to bottom approaches, which is lithography, or the assembly of materials uh, using modules or building blocks that are nano uh, uh, scale in size, and the, therefore that is what we call a a bottom-up approach. So either way, the uh, structuring of nanomaterials is very important, and you can do it on a variety of films or, or surfaces. Uh, actually, this um, view graph shows you the type of uh, work that can be done on coatings or flat surfaces that may involve buildup of uh, uh, polyelectrolytes or chemical assembly of uh, um, monomers that are based on silane, siloxane, thiol, cross-linking, or even building up of films by vapor deposition. Uh, our group in particular specializes with grafting of polymers called polymer brushes, and today I'll show you our work uh, involving that of electropatterning or electrodeposition. So let's talk about electropatterning and nanopatterning. Why, why the interest on um, patterns or features derived from uh, conjugated, bi-conjugated, or even uh, electrically conducting polymers. Uh, as you can see here, uh, polymers can be used for preparing uh, solar uh, cells, photovoltaic cells, transistors, actuators, light emitting materials, and sensors. So this is possible because polymers, uh, and of course everybody knows them as as the more popular term of plastic, uh, can actually be made uh, electrically conducting or optically active. So this is usually based on uh, conjugated polymers that are able to have pi electron delocalization or charge hopping mechanisms, uh, very popular of which are the polythiophenes, the polyanilines, and the polypyrroles but uh, synthetically they can be accessed not only by step-by-step uh, -step, uh, uh, metal mediated reactions but even electrochemistry or electrochemically using anodic uh, polymerization of the corresponding monomers. So the result is you have polymers with this extended pi conjugated backbone for the ability to produce polaritons and solitons that can charge half to other chains, and therefore chain hopping is a very important mechanism. Uh, actually, our group has specialized, uh, especially in the past, the synthesis of uh, 
various types of architectures of these conducting polymers uh, shown here in terms of dendrimers or copolymers or ladder type polymers. And these have very interesting um, optical and electrically conducting features such that they are very useful in solid state devices uh, including solar cells and LED materials. So the interest on electrochemistry is that you can actually use a monomer like thiophene, inject electrons, and therefore you have the formation of radical cations, which then combine to produce your dimer. And if you repeat this process enough with the loss of protons, or what we call uh, anodic uh, electropolymerization, you will end up with uh, polythiophene. And this can be done by cyclic voltammetry, potential static methods, um, uh, galvanostatic, uh, etc. So the injection of electron means that we build up these radical cations which then build up larger polymers. So uh, in this scheme, uh, the question is, is it possible to get fine patterning for electric de deposition on electrode or selective deposition of these polymers on patterns? So actually a big problem uh, with electrochemistry or electropolymerization is that uh, it uh, results in poor deposition of the polymer on a surface resulting in ill-defined morphology as shown here. Or if you have a polymer that actually remains soluble with the solvent used for electrodeposition, uh, you get poor film formation. So back in the early uh, 2000, uh, we actually devised a route to make water, I mean, a, a polymers that essentially cross-link upon deposition. And this turned out to be a key to many of the technologies we've developed, including uh, electron nanopatterning, in that by putting the monomers as part of the main chain or side group of an existing uh, pi-conjugated polymer backbone, as you deposit them on the surface or as you electropolymerize them, you end up with a highly cross-linked network uh, which still contains the uh, pi-conjugated uh, chain or electrically conducting polymer of interest. So with that, uh, we demonstrated, for example, that we can make polyfluorines by the position of a precursor polymer like this uh, to form very nice films accessible by electropolymerization or use of polysiloxane polyferrol precursors like this, which actually resulted in very interesting morphologies as shown here, uh, as interrogated by AFM to form these uh, nanodot phase separated structures. Or in the case of another commercially available polymer called PBK, <coughs> they form nice films which have different morphologies on the dope and D-dope state. So, all of those three polymers that I've just shown you were deposited by electropolymerization. So what I'm actually trying to give you here is a good appreciation of electrochemistry and electropolymerization as a route for making films and in a short while for patterning. Uh, so for example, a practical application of this method is we can electrodeposit polyvinyl carbazole on a ITO substrate and then spin coating polyfluorine on top of it. The result of which is we got a very tunable and efficient device that's blue emitting based on a polymer light emitting diode where the performance or the turn on voltage can be tuned by the doping properties of the deposited polymer. So before we go to more patterning strategies, I, I'd, like, I'd just like to uh, show you that these polymers can actually deposit them uh, with a different route. Uh, our group specializes on another technique, synthetic technique called polymer brush grafting, where we can graft a polymer as a brush or a hair, uh, if you may, either by a grafting onto, a grafting through, and a grafting from approach. Uh, the result is that we can make polymer brushes, as shown here, using surface grafted initiator. By depositing this polymer, we can then have the precursor polymer directly on the uh, substrate 
of interest in this case injunctive oxide. So we can graph polyvinyl carbazole as shown here. These polymer brushes in turn modify the ITO as you can see here from a very rough surface to a smooth film surface. And then we can electropolymerize them to produce these efficient devices. And so this is the case that we can prepare uh, uh, tunable and more efficient LED devices by cross-linking a old transport polyvinyl carbazole um, polymer on top of the ITO surface. So again, AFM shows the change in morphology from ITO to grafted polymer and then finally across the polymer on the surface. So AFM definitely is a very, very important characterization tool. So now let's talk about patterning. Um, just to review, patterning means that we can access the surface through lithographic or non-lithographic methods. Lithography often involves that of using a resist material, which can then be patterned by photomasking or uh, use of an ion beam or even an electron beam type of patterning, where then you can remove the unreacted resin material. On the other hand, non-lithographic methods uh, simply involves, or soft lithographic methods would simply involve uh, microcontact printing, uh, uh, addition of material by uh, lithographic or nanolithographic materials or nano shaving, or <coughs> in, the, in our case, <coughs> I'll introduce to you electrochemical nanopatterning. And this means that AFM is a very important tool because you can use the cantilever tip uh, to deliver a material, deliver a bias voltage or cause heating. Now, uh, we are not the only one in this game, and many uh, uh, groups, uh, many instrument features, including that of the Park AFM, have shown that you can actually use oxidation lithography, anodic oxidation, or you can do the opposite, you can do cathodic reduction uh, on any electroactive material, whether it's a metal or a polymer, as, as we've been doing, and then because of the uh, pattern that can be translated from the uh, uh, electronic file to the cantilever tip movement, you can make this nice feature. So as you can see here, these are very interesting pictures, a uh, painting by Michael Angelo or image of uh, Marilyn Monroe. And you can look at the scale. We're talking here about microns. So these are truly nano patterning methods based on uh, electrochemistry, uh, either reduction or oxidation. Now, uh, polymers can be patterned or deposited on materials as, as I've shown you uh, as films. Now, in this case, we've demonstrated that we can actually do deposition of a precursor polymer on a, a micro dot printed electrode as shown here, resulting in this very interesting blue array of this polyvaric polymer. And this was actually done, can be done either by cyclic voltammetry as shown here or by potentiostatic methods. And this goes back 12 years ago. Now one of the things that we discovered, and this was actually done uh, uh, at the beginning in Singapore when I was doing a sabbatical, so very interesting story. Uh, I, uh, you know, as a professor, of course, we, we have the liberty to do sabbaticals and uh, for longer periods of time. So it so happened back in 2004 that I did a sabbatical in Singapore. And on my last week, um, I have not shown any useful thing to my uh, host except to enjoy the food in Singapore. So I'm a bit embarrassed. I asked uh, one of the graduate students to try this for me. So we spin coated polyvinyl carbazole. Uh, as shown here, as commercially available polymer on gold substrate. And then I asked him to try to make a pattern uh, or make the cantilever tip, which is made up of uh, another conducting metal. I think it's silicon nitride uh, or even gold. And then as we move that, uh, we should, in principle, polymerize polyvinyl carbazole 
can cross link to this uh, species. So we can have an insoluble pattern or polymer. So actually, uh, uh, in a short term, in a matter of days, we actually got this very nice pattern, very interesting uh, patterns that were done under ambient conditions. And you can see a fine resolution here of sub 100 nanometer lines. And uh, it was interesting because uh, simply by spin coating the polymer PBK, doing this patterning under room temperature, ambient condition without vacuum, we can get easily these lines. And we found that these patterns, a change in size, height, diameter, depending on the voltage that we apply or the writing speed, so that we can actually track this correlation uh, as shown here, here again, based on the height, the width of the pattern, uh, and again, the parameter we can play is the writing speed or the bias voltage. So actually, this gives a, gave us a clue that this is a very effective way, in fact, simple way to create nano patterns simply by electropolymerization. Uh, interestingly, when we tried the same thing under vacuum, meaning if we evacuated humidity, it did not work. So this is one of the things that if I had done this patterning in uh, Houston or any laboratory with a controlled environment, we probably would not have discovered this process. So this is quite serendipitous in that hot and humid Singapore actually provided the magic ingredient for us to get this uh, interesting pattern. So if you notice here, or if you didn't notice, I highlighted here the presence of a water meniscus. Now, doing the patterning under ambient condition means that we have residual water uh, that's present on the surface, or any surface, actually, even your face has a lot of moisture or water, uh, especially in a humid environment. And, and the AFM surface is no exception. It's, it was actually interesting or rather important that this water was present because it acted as a electrochemical bridge that resulted in the injection of electrons, the transfer of ions that resulted in the reaction as shown here. So this electrochemical cross-linking would have not been possible in the absence of water. Okay. So water is our magic ingredient. So since then, we have published many other papers. Uh, this one, uh, actually, it's been published already, uh, involved that of another precursor polymer based on the uh, third thiophene, where we simply uh, apply, again, the bias voltage, electropolymerize it, and then we can control the pattern features as shown here by the bias voltage or by writing speed. Now, again, these nice AFM pictures are interesting morphologically, but one of the things one can do with AFM is to use what we call the conducting AFM mode or uh, current sensing mode in that you can convert a morphological feature into a current map, which means that we can see the areas which you have a higher conductivity. So the higher conductivity is shown here by the blue regions, which blue to green, etc., which then corresponds to the areas where we actually had electropolymerization. So the conducting polymer was formed, and therefore it has a more conducting material. Actually, because of the material that was then used to form this, there was a depletion of materials on the neighboring regions resulting in more insulating properties. So what's interesting here is it demonstrated some principles of writing. So in, for, in principle, we can write a pattern, draw a pattern, or write information based on simply uh, electropolymerizing a region where we have uh, the application of a bias voltage. Now, uh, our group is also a synthetic chemistry group. We pride ourselves in making some very exotic materials, including these dendrimers and this hybrid dendrimer materials. This is interesting because these quantum dots and these gold nanoparticles are optically active, whether it's electroluminescent, photoluminescent, or plasmonic. 
And the appearance of this third thiopine or let's say carbazole on the peripheral group means that we can actually use them for film formation or electropatterning. So just to show you some of the polymers we made, and this is of interest, should be of interest to synthetic chemists. Uh, we've used them to make nano objects or materials for sensors. And the synthesis of this is very interesting because we can use an AB2 convergent method to produce this uh, G1 generation, G2, uh, G3, and G4. So what this simply means is that we can control the number of carbazole species on the periphery simply by design of the dendimer or its generation. So what are these useful for? for? Well, uh, uh, they, they are very interesting in terms of film morphology, as you can see here. We can make uh, them float at the interface and then gather them using a langer blodgett trap. And they form very interesting features. Uh, here they can form uh, pearls, pearl necklaces, spaghetti-like structures, and so on, uh, depending on the uh, compression speed or the feature. So, so I'd be happy to talk more about this, except that this is not our focus. But if you take these films, what's interesting is they're patternable. So we can take these films and then electropolymerize them, and we can still create a pattern based on cyclic voltammetry or, uh, or uh, the application of a bias voltage in a nanopattern. And, and this has actually been published. Now another uh, method of making films in our lab is called the layer by layer approach. Uh, this involves the use of polyelectrolytes, nanoparticles, proteins, small dyes, and the method of delivery or absorption can be electrostatic in nature, hydrogen bonding, ion dipole. So the main thing is we can build up these layers uh, in an alternating approach. So this is what we call beaker chemistry, where we simply uh, dip the substrate surface, wash them, dip it to the oppositely charged polyelectrolyte, wash them, and they repeat the process again and again and again. The result is you can build up easily nanostructured or nanocomposite films simply by absorbing one layer, one layer doesn't mean one polymer layer, but one layer of the material, where charge repulsion actually helps you to deposit only a very thin film. So uh, our group, many other groups have focused on this, but our group in particular has done a lot of work as well. Uh, again, this is not the focus of our talk, but uh, you can search literature on all the different applications we have applied the layer by layer approach. So one combination that we tried involved that of the copper thalocyanin dye, very uh, interesting for photodynamic therapy and other types of uh, commercial applications. So actually, this is a commercial available dye. And an oligothiophene with a uh, quaternary ammonium group that we attach on both sides. So this is what we call a uh, ionine or a uh, oligomeric material. So what we did is in combination with this positively charged material and this negatively charged material, we built up layers and we can investigate their electrochemical behavior as shown here. Now the interesting thing is that we can switch from redox to oxidized state or we can go from a charge negative uh, injection, uh, negative voltage to an, another state, a positive voltage, and we can switch them back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And just to show you this can be done, the following group uh, experiment shows we can do repeated charging, discharging, charging, discharging, discharging. So one may ask, what is the interest of this? Well, it turns out that since you can vary the semiconductor state of the material, you can use this to essentially store information. Or you can use this to uh, uh, keep the film in a charge or discharge state. Meaning 
by switching back and forth, you can actually look at the change in the absorption properties based on, let's say, a laser uh, uh, and a detector going through, meaning you can go switching from a redox to oxidized state or uh, uh, in terms of uh, the optical property, uh, you can go from a dope to the dope uh, stage. So again, we're talking here about patterning. So uh, how does patterning play a role with this type of pins? Well, it turns out that we can read, write, erase these features or charging very specifically by taking these films and using our AFM tip to create patterns. So in principle, we can charge this by preparing these lines as shown here uh, in the uh, um, morphological state, or we can erase them. We can apply the opposite charge and remove the pattern as demonstrated by the AFM and the LFM or the lateral, lateral force microscopy method. In fact, if we utilize the current sensing AFM method, uh, this distinction is very clear. This uh, shows that the morphological pattern does, does not show much differentiation in feature. However, when we look at the current AFM map, we can clearly see that the patterns were actually written on the surface. So this is a type of memory device application for charging, discharging effect, which allows us to write charges on a conducting material. Uh, actually, another display of this can be simply done by taking a commercially available uh, material called PDOT PSS. PDOT PSS can be uh, uh, prepared. It's a water-soluble complex deposited on a material. And again, we can do this exercise of charging, discharging. But actually, what's interesting is because of the application of a bias voltage, you actually heat up the sample, or what we call dual heating, and this becomes another mechanism by which you can create a pattern. In this case, the pattern was is actually produced by playing around with the glass transition property of the polymer or even the melting point. Uh, so here, what we can see is features simply by taking that uh, uh, P dot PSS material that was uh, spin coated or even prepared by layer by layer. And you can make different height features as shown here or changing the writing speed and you can get different types of pattern height uh, generation. Okay, So again, AFM utilized as a patterning method but AFM also utilized as a characterization method. And here is a summary of how we can uh, create these features. Uh, these are what we call worm devices or write once uh, memory devices. When we write the pattern, interestingly, we cannot erase them as efficiently as the other material. So as we write erase, write erase, you can see the degradation of the erasability uh, depending on the number of layers. Uh, so again, these are still useful methods for uh, memory device application, but you can only write them once. So if you remember the writing on a CD-ROM uh, device technology back in the 90s and 80s even, uh, you can distinguish between a writable and erasable CD-ROM. Uh, so these are CD-ROM, uh, essentially analogs, where you can only write the pattern or information or data only once. And again, <clears throat> what's interesting is you can use morphology or even currency sensing AFM map to uh, distinguish the features. So again, the higher resolution uh, images can be done. You can actually measure the conductivity of each of these patterns by doing IV characterization. And you can see here the definitely these are conducting patterns. And by changing the voltage, you can change the IV curve uh, characteristics. 
Now, I'm almost done here. Uh, let me tell you one last project that we did. Uh, this is a, a polymer that was synthesized by one of my students back then, uh, Cheng Yu Wang. Uh, what it is, it's, it's basically a combination of two types of polymers, a polyvinyl pyridine with a carbazole unit, a polyacrylic acid with a carbazole unit, what that means is we have a positively charged polymer and a negatively charged polymer. And then we can alternate the deposition of these two polymers and observe the film growth. So actually the film growth can easily be seen by the increase in the absorbance as we increase the number of layers. So this is a typical Beer's law or a combination of these two with uh, polyacrylic acid alone or another copolymer gives us different absorbance density as an, even as an increase in the number of layers. So, so the bottom line here is we can make films of a very much controlled thickness and dye composition or uh, even um, uh, electropolymerizable monomer composition. So the question is can we make these two carbazole units react? So the answer is yes. The same uh, electropolymerization method that involves the carbazole units reacting to form the uh, uh, carbazole dimer can be traced by electrochemical methods. So electrochemically, yes, we are forming these species. We change the characteristics for the number of layers, or we look at the shift in the oxidation and reduction waves as a proof that the electropolymerization takes place. So uh, what do we do with these films? Are these patternable? Can we use uh, AFM to make patterns? So the answer is yes. Uh, we can write patterns. We can uh, prepare uh, different lines, different heights. We can write. So my student, uh, Gochan, was uh, involved in most of the characterization and patterning. And uh, both of them worked together on this project. Uh, and uh, Gochan prepared these patterns and many, many other patterns which uh, I, I don't have time to show. Uh, except for, you know, one night when I was about to leave, he showed me this pattern. It's a heart-shaped pattern that he prepared. And I, I, I told him, you know, why, why are you preparing heart-shaped patterns in our lab? We're not going to use that for our publication. And he just told me he likes to prepare uh, different patterns, uh, including the heart shape pattern. So I noticed that both of them work very hard in the night, uh, in the evenings. Uh, and then in two to three weeks, they came up with some results, but they also announced a very important thing. They said they were getting married. So actually, uh, the interesting story is that uh, we have a lab, a lab story in our group as well. And their work was actually published in Macromolecules in the Page. So electro patterning very useful. Uh, probably uh, united these two graduate students in matrimony, and uh, we created good science. So with that, I'd like to thank you and be happy to answer any questions you may have. Wonderful, and that's always a great story to come back to. Um, okay, let's take a look at the queue of questions that have come in. And uh, if you haven't already uh, typed in your questions, uh, remember there is a specific module on your control panel for you to send those in. Um, and we'll answer them right after the ones we already have in queue. So the ones that we already have. Um, first, concerning memory. <clears throat> Can you also use magnetic force microscopy as an approach in order to write and erase these patterns? Interesting, yes. Uh, yeah, interesting. We have not tried that, but in principle, uh, you can have a polymer uh, with a uh, uh, ferric oxide or magnetic nanoparticles embedded. If somehow your uh, cantilever is able to uh, change the polarization, magnetize, demagnetize the material, that's embedded in the film, uh, you can probably use that as a memory uh, device application. Now, I, I uh, will not be surprised if somebody has already done that. 
if nobody has done that, that's very interesting. Uh, what you actually need there is, of course, the preparation of a film that uh, should contain some uh, magnetic uh, properties, uh, which then you can use the AFM tip to uh, change the polarization or magnetization property. But an uh, important ingredient is that you need to have a nice film to do this work. Very good. <clears throat> and uh, the next question reads, coming to electro nano patterning, how fast is this method compared to, let's say, EBL, for example? A uh, very good question. Um, the movement uh, we have uh, essentially is as fast as the scanning method. Uh, uh, we can move the tip slowly, micrometers uh, per second. Uh, micrometers per second, yes. Uh, so uh, you want to move the tip, of course, uh, and to coincide it with the reaction kinetics as well. And uh, electrochemically, you are dealing then, of course, with the residence time of the tip on a surface. So, so just to give you, uh, yeah, an idea of the number. Yeah, these uh, lines were written in micrometers per second uh, speed. So one to ten to twenty, uh, we can easily get patterns. So compare that with electron beam lithography. Uh, then you simply compare that in the same rate of micrometers per second speed. Now, one thing I can say, of course, is with e-beam lithography, uh, it's very possible to go to even uh, smaller features. The best that we have done this patterning are essentially sub-100 nanometer features. So the question is, if with e-beam lithography, are you able to access even 10 nanometer lines? Uh, so, uh, one of the things that one has to deal with uh, SPM or AFM is, of course, the tip uh, geometry or the tip uh, size or, or sharpness. Uh, in uh, one of the things that I proposed, I was thinking of using an ultra-sharp tip um, that can produce even thinner lines or uh, maybe using a carbon nanotube as a tip, although carbon nanotube will have problems in terms of its uh, modulus and strength. By principle, this technique can be extended to uh, a very sharp or ultra-sharp tip, uh, tips. Uh, however, it again will depend on how flat and how smooth the precursor writing film is. So, so in principle, uh, what we're doing here is embedded chemistry. So the embedded chemistry is that either the monomer is part of the film uh, or the magnetic nanoparticle as part of the film, as opposed to, uh, let's say, deep pen nanolithography or shading, where you need to deliver a material or shave off a material here. The material or the ink is essentially already part of the film. Excellent. Well put. So, <clears throat> uh, while we wait for additional questions to possibly come down the pipeline, I'd like to uh, remind everyone that today's webinar, as well as all the previous ones in this series, uh, are recorded. And in about a week or so after today's session, uh, my counterparts at our corporate HQ should have the uh, video from today's presentation up on our website. And let me drop that into the chat for everybody here to reference. Uh, it's on the Nano Academy section of parkafm.com. Here you'll see YouTube links to streams that have been recorded from the likes of Professor Dvinkula, like today, as well as Professor Baker from Indiana University, and uh, we'll be looking for additional speakers as well in the future. So if you happen to have any ideas or any suggestions for topics that you may like us to, uh, to cover, definitely send an email to uh, myself either through parkafm.com or just to me directly. I'll leave my address there as well in the chat. Uh, to reach the uh, Advincula Research Group at Case Western Reserve University. Their uh, web address is there on the screen that uh, the professor has. It's rcapoly.net, www.rcapoly.net, again at Case Western Reserve University. Um, professor, um, can we have your title slide up again for your email address? Okay. Perfect. 
perfect. And as you can see there, everyone, uh, his email address, if you'd like to reach him after today's talk, is rca41 at case.edu. Okay, well, uh, with that reminder out of the way, I think, uh, yeah, no questions, no other questions have shown up here on our end. Uh, if you have any closing thoughts, Professor, I guess we can take them now. Yes, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our audience today. Uh, be happy to uh, answer your inquiries uh, if you email me uh, at this address. And uh, again, I'd like to thank Art AFM for sponsoring this series uh, of uh, lectures, uh, webinars, uh, including uh, access to uh, their instruments and technical support as well. So thank you very much, Gerald. Oh, you're quite welcome, Professor. And thank you again for lending your expertise across all of these fields very diverse amount of fields uh, for our webinar series and uh, for everyone here uh, for spending time out of your busy schedules to uh, visit us today here live on the internet. Um, for all of your atomic force microscopy and scanning probe microscopy needs to enable your nanoscale advances, uh, please visit Park Systems at parkafm.com and I guess we'll be seeing uh, everyone here next month. Our next topic is scheduled to be drilling fluids but we will finalize that with an email blast and, of course, the publicity uh, to confirm that next month. This is a monthly series, after all, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. So uh, with that out of the way, thank you very much again, and uh, good luck, and hopefully we'll see you down the line. Take care, everyone. <laughs>